you are in a right environment. I like this place. The light and everything is nice. It's all good. <laughs> yes, it's all good. I'm so happy. Okay. You sure you had your water right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. No problem. So, um, I'll show them these two of the books, uh, which was available by Penguin. Um, is it av available on uh, Amazon and all that as well? It'll be available online and, uh, yeah, at the Arts House. Like, okay. The, so, I can tell my viewers that they can also purchase it through online, like Amazon and all yeah. that. Okay, good. Yeah. And also, uh, you can reveal to them how they can write to you or contact you through Facebook or other social sure. networks. Yeah, you can, you can do that as well, too. So, um, that's a good thing. Okay, Great. Good. Thank you so much. So, I, shall, shall I uh, address you as Miss Manjushi, Manjushi, is it correct? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Manjushi, yeah. Ma Manjushi, okay. I just want to make sure it's that. It's very long, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's your name. Manjushi. Tapa. Is that correct? Tapa? Yeah. Okay, great. So we shall look at the camera for a few seconds. Hi, welcome to the National Quiz Choice Online News Say at Hyatt. Uh, I'm Robin Steinberg and welcome to our show again. And today we have a special guest, uh, an author, a leading novelist uh, in this part of the world. And she has written a number of great uh, work uh, on South Asian uh, issues. And she's none other than uh, Miss uh, Manjushi Tapar, uh, whom I have here on my right. And uh, she's a novelist, a short story writer, e uh, an easiest and translator. And she's one of the most engaging uh, interpreters of modern Nepal. And her themes are drawn from Nepali life and the experience of migration shared by many Nepalis. And according to her biography, you know, she has uh, written uh, one of the many titles such as uh, The Tutor of History, uh, a collection of short stories, Tilt Earth, and two powerful works of nonfiction, Forget Kamandu and The Lives We Have Lost. Her, her, her most recent novel, Seasons of Flight, deals with migration experience, and she has written a biography titled A Boy from Skillis and has translated the works of 94, sorry, 49 Nepali writers and poets into English in, a country, in The Country Is Yours. Her writings have appeared in The New York Times, The London Review of Books, The Globe, and Mail from in Canada. She has divided her time between Kathmandu and Toronto and is working on a novel set in a world of international aid. And, uh, and of course, these are the two books that uh, I would like you guys to so look out for the Tilt Earth and a boy from Skillis. It's just among the first two that I've seen so far, and they are truly recommended. And uh, here I have uh, Miss uh, uh, Majushi. Welcome to our show. Thank you. Uh, you have a great, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, bio data uh, that you have set yourself uh, on the issues of Nepal in your writings. Uh, many of asked right now is. Uh, why Nepal? Uh, <laughs> yes, you know, uh, of, of all South Asians, why Nepal? No, and what actually inspired you to write uh, you know, the issues that is happening in Nepal in your writings? Um, I'm from Nepal. I uh, grew up both in Nepal and in the United States and Canada also for parts of my life. And so I'm both an insider of Nepal and also I see it with an outside view. Um, when I began to write, I was um, in my 20s when I, I started my first book. And um, Nepal, that was in the 1990s, Nepal has been going through a lot of very rapid change. And, uh, you know, it's a very um, rich culture with over a hundred different ethnic groups and languages and, you know, a lot of variety within the population. Um, so there's already a lot of material to write about, and uh, also it's been going through a very, very rapid change of modernization and democratization. We became a democracy in 1990, and there's been a lot of political um, turbulence that has come with it. So for a writer, um, there's a lot of material to write about and a lot of inspiration to write about, because all around you, you see people's lives changing and, you know, all of the conflicts that... Um, come with modern Nepali life. So um, that's why 
I found it very moving to write about Nepal and, and I'm very interested. Almost all of my books um, are set in Nepal and a few of them are about Nepalese abroad. So there's a very large uh, Nepali diaspora also. Um, and so that's become the material that I write about. And what is the diaspora for Nepal, uh, like Nepalese like yourself, mean? Uh, because there's so much uh, also migration uh, uh, everywhere in the world. Uh, what does it mean to be a Nepalese? It's an interesting and open-ended identity right now. Um, you know, uh, Nepalese have been migrating for uh, from the beginning of the 19th century. Um, Nepal had uh, Gurkha recruitment, and so you know, in Singapore, in the rest of the world, in the UK, in India, there are Nepali soldiers who are working as part of the national armies of police, um, and so that's always been a very uh, big influence on Nepali culture, the, the sort of outside influence has come in through that route. And after that, right now, particularly Nepal is one of these countries where a lot of uh, Nepalese um, migrate um, ec for economic reasons. So they leave the country. I think by conservative estimates, um, three million Nepalese are living abroad. There are probably more than that. And they actually are keeping the country financially afloat. So Nepali identity is very, very mixed up right now. It's, you know, there's a very deep traditional culture um, and many, you know, much diversity within that also. Um, and then there's, you know, they're everywhere. I mean, you can go to any remote corner of the world now and you will find a Nepali community. Um, and Nepalese are very quick to assimilate and to pick up um, foreign cultures too. So they really mix into the local population very well in many places. So it's a very interesting and open identity. And speaking about identity, is loyalty part of the culture? Because I've, I've observed from, from many materials that's been written about them, especially about the Grukas, okay. you know, um, it, it, is it the evident that it's part of the culture? It's, you know, I would say that there's a very strain, uh, a strong strain of justice that runs through a Nepali culture, that um, if people are treated in a, in a way that is fair and just, that, that uh, Nepalese tend to respond with a lot of honesty and, and integrity. Um, it's when there is injustice and, you know, there, in, in many environments they do face injustice, then, you know, it, it's, there's conflict. But um, it's a very um, straightforward uh, culture in that sense that if they're treated well, they're very um, straightforward about it. So it's not based on, on any religious, uh, you know, uh, practices whatsoever, based on their loyalty? I um, I don't uh, I don't think of it so much as religious as as cultural. I think it's a uh, it's a very it's a society that really seeks to be egalitarian and just and you know everyone treats everyone quite well. Um, that's the the aspiration. It doesn't always happen, of course, but <laughs> that's what people want. Now uh, let's get back to your books that you have written so far. You know, uh, Tilt Earth, uh, and uh, everyone, please look up for her title, Tilt Earth. Uh, it's among the, the one of the very uh, moving stories that you've written so far, uh, and yet uh, people are asking the the diversity of the of Nepal today. You know, um, are we still seeing poverty in Nepal? That's the number one question. Is there equality as well? Does the Nepali uh, government? Uh, doing something about the equality, the issues of equality in health? It's, you know, uh, from 1990 when we first got democracy till now, uh, there's been a very strong struggle to try and get a fully democratic um, political structure in place, and it hasn't quite succeeded. So we're still waiting for a new constitution. We're still waiting to see whether, um, you know, democratic values like equality between the genders, between the castes, between um, all of the diverse groups, communities in Nepal, whether that becomes part of a new constitution. There's been a lot of struggle for that. It's been a very uh, difficult 20 or 25 years for Nepal. Um, but the, the aspiration is definitely to come up with a democratic framework, and that's what we're trying to do right now. Um, in terms of poverty, it's, it's um, Partly because of the political turmoil that has accompanied this process. We've had a war, we've had a Maoist struggle, we've had a lot of violence. Um, 
and so economically the country has not done very well and this has forced many Nepalese to leave the country mm. in search of work. So there is still a, a, a quite shocking level of poverty in Nepal and quite a lot of injustice in terms of the culture, if not the law, then it, the culture is, still remains very unequal and hierarchical. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, about this book, uh, A Boy from Skilis, um, there, is there a character, I mean you wrote a character of the life and times of Chandra Gurund. Um, what's so unique about this person, really? Um, you know, uh, he was an environmentalist in Nepal. Nepal is uh, very well known for uh, its policies in community forestry, in giving the local people control over their own forests. Mm -hmm. It's been a very successful program. Um, for me, he was a mentor. He was someone I, I worked with early on in my life, and he's someone who really taught me a lot that I know about Nepal. Um, there was a, a helicopter accident that he and many of Nepal's leading environmentalists died in some years ago, and so I decided to write this book as a way of, um, for the younger generation, consolidating the knowledge and experience that we have in the in the forestry sector and in the conservation sector. He was a very, very dynamic man, um, very um, and had a very lasting influence. And is and speak about influence. Did he also influence in your writings as well? The way he, your outlook is. He influenced uh, what I write about. Um, because he was an environmentalist, so he wasn't that interested in writing. But when I worked with him early on in my career, just when I was out of college, I worked with him in the rural parts of Nepal, um, outside of Kashmandu in the hills. And so that gave me exposure to daily life in Nepal, outside of the cities, outside of, you know, in the most remote parts of the country. And so that gave me material to write about. It definitely influenced me very deeply. Now, about the forestry uh, and environmental issues in Nepal, what's happening today, right now, and compared to, say, five to ten years ago, uh, has there been any uh, impact uh, been made uh, by his life? The policies that are in place uh, right now in terms of community forestry were all uh, set during his time. Um, and it's been a long, almost 40-year effort by the Nepali government, and it's been one of the areas of success for Nepal, and it remains successful even now. And could you give us some pointers of, of the success rate uh, about this environmental movement? Uh, has to, have they managed to, to preserve in, in the, the environmental issues that has been emphasized in this book? In, uh, in a lot of the hill areas um, where community for forestry is practiced in Nepal, uh, you see a very direct link between um, where community forestry is practiced and where there's more diversity in terms of the ecosystem and a healthier ecology. So um, the area that he particularly set up is in the Annapurna areas, in, right at the base of the Annapurna Himalayas. Mm -hmm. Um, and that area, which is a Gurung area, his name is Chanta Gurung, and that's a, a large community of Nepal, ethnic group of Nepal. So he set up that area, and there have been many studies that show that in that area there's far more um, diversity in terms of the species of plants and just also in, in the number of plants, forest cover, um, animals, and you know, uh, wildlife. So. Uh, that's been very well documented and established. So, viewers, please look up for this book, uh, A Boy from Skilis, The Life and Times of Chandra Gurung, and it's one of these hot uh, moving stories about his cause on environment. And it's also published by Penguin, and if you can't find it, you could, you could just Google uh, on Amazon and you might be lucky enough to get a, a copy of it. And also, uh, we're going to talk about Tilt Earth. Uh, now, what's the uh, the story here? You know, uh, Tilt Earth you know, talks about uh, uh, about the uh, poetic issues and and uh, and affairs of of different uh, diversity of people. Um, what was the inspiration behind this book? This um, Tilt Earth is a collection of sto short stories. Yes, and indeed. so there are a lot of um, different stories in it. And I wrote them over a period of almost 10 years. Wow. So 
and uh, some of them are set in Kathmandu and some of them are set among Nepalese abroad and some of them are set in rural Nepal. So I'll talk about a couple of the stories. There's one story called um, The Buddha in the Earth Touching Posture. And of course, you know, the Buddha, um, the historical figure of the Buddha was born in Nepal in an area called Lumbini in southern Nepal. And I had gone there uh, to see, there's a, a large um, park that has been set up there with UN supervision, a sort of large master plan has come into place. Mm -hmm. And so this area has Buddhist monasteries from all of the countries where Buddhism is practiced around the world. So you have, you know, a German monastery, you have, you know, um, uh, sort of a French monastery, and then you also have the traditional, you know, Burmese and the Chinese and, you know, other uh, countries have built monasteries. It's, it's a very beautiful area. Um, so one of the stories is set in that area where the Buddha was born. Um, and uh, uh, have you seen it yourself? I have been there. I have been there. It's a very beautiful area. It's very moving. It's it's um, mm. just to think that that's where so much knowledge Amazing. came out of. Still Earth. Um, and then I have other stories in here. There's a story about um, a love marriage. You know, in Nepal, uh, it's still the norm to have an arranged marriage. Oh, really? It is to today. It is still very much. On the twenty-first the century. Absolutely. Wow. <laughs> it's, okay. Um, <laughs> so careful, gentlemen. If you go to Nepal, please think twice before you get married to a Nepalis, and uh, I, I urge you, uh, <laughs> stay at a Hyatt. <laughs> so one of the stories is about um, a couple who defies this and falls in love and has an intercaste marriage um, called a love marriage, you know, as okay. opposed to an arranged marriage. So there are a lot of different stories like that in here. Oh. But how about death? What happens to the to the woman or to to, to a man if? Let's say one, of, you know, if your wife or your husband pass on, uh, what happens? There's, uh, there are a lot of different cultural practices in the Buddhist uh, communities. Uh, remarriage is an option that's okay. possible. Um, in the Hindu communities, and particularly in the very traditional Hindu communities, um, it's possible for the man to remarry, but for the woman, it is not. Really? When her husband dies, that is it for the rest of her life. She has to be alone. There's a, you know, now there are women who defy that and who are changing that culture oh. and um, adopting more modern values, but that, that's the traditional Hindu system. Now, the politics of Nepal, what's happening today right now? Um, you know, do you think that moving forward, mm -hmm. you know, and you're writing, in the process of writing your, your new book, okay. you know, um, are you going to include some insights it's, you know, uh, uh, the political situation right now is that we're trying to come up with a new constitution and to try and make the constitution a fully democratic constitution. So there's, there are different political parties who have different interests and it hasn't worked out. Um, we've been trying to do this since 2008 and we still don't have a constitution. So right now it's a little bit problematic, mm -hmm. but I, I think going into the future we will soon have, mm -hmm. you know, within but, a year or so. So what is democracy to a, to a local Nepalis? What does it mean to them? I think there's a lot of faith in democracy in Nepal. There's the belief that once we get a fully democratic system, mm -hmm. people will um, uh, become better off, that you know, there'll be better government, there'll be more wealth creation, uh, the private sector will have a good environment in which to work. Um, and so I think people are really waiting for a, a, a good democratic structure to come in so that then everyone can start nation building. Mm -hmm. Because um, it's been many, many years that we've just been waiting for the structure, you know, so that we can start really growing economically. Now, in your next book that you're writing, uh, that's based on the uh, role uh, of international aid, mm. is that going to be based in Nepal again? It is based in Nepal. It's based um, at several levels in the aid industry, which is a very complex mm. um, industry in Nepal. Almost 60% of Nepal's national budget comes from foreign aid. Mm -hmm. So it's a country that's very heavily dependent on foreign aid. Um, and a lot of this aid has made a difference, but a lot of it also just disappears. 
And so my novel is set in um, Kathmandu at the level of the donors mm -hmm. and also all the way down to the village level where you mm -hmm. see what impact it has on the lives of villagers. Mm -hmm. um, so it goes all the way down to... And what's your philosophy of, uh, of writing books that's, that is so diverse and yet there is also politi political insights? I write both, you know, I write both fiction and non-fiction. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, A Boy from Cyclis is a non-fiction book, uh, Tilled Earth, and I have two other novels, they're, mm -hmm. they're fiction. I go back and forth between mm -hmm. them. Um, I find that fiction is, it's a deeper engagement with the place because fiction goes into the hearts of people. It goes into the minds and the imagination, and so it's a slower, and deeper uh, process of working, um, whereas nonfiction is a more immediate response. So, because the country has been going through so much political change and difficulty, nonfiction has been a very good way for me to respond to that, to record it, mm -hmm. to write about it, to um, document it. Mm -hmm. um, but fiction is, for me, deeper and more emotional and more satisfying in a way. Do you see yourself as an evangelist uh, for the police? I mean, because it, it seems to me that uh, my readers uh, who wrote to me and said that, you know, they, they read your books and they told me, and even I observed that, that uh, your cause, you know, is very much very pro-democracy uh, future for Nepal. And it sounds like a cry uh, from, from your books that you've written, you know. And, um, is that true? It is true. Um, it is true. I, I do think you cry often when you write, write those books? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do, actually. Um, both fiction and non-fiction. Non-fiction because the subject matter is so um, difficult sometimes. It, it's, it's a very um, frustrating thing to watch a country unable to find democracy after such a long time, after 1990. It's been trying, 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 and still doesn't have it. Um, so. When I write non-fiction, I, I cry because of that. Um, fiction, because, you know, I think all writers become so involved with their characters. They become like your best friends, you know, each novel for really? me. Really? Oh, wow. It takes about three years or four years to write a novel. And in that time, you, you're you living with this person mm -hmm. in your heart. And when you end the book, it always feels like a death. It always feels like you're, you've lost that friend. Have you, have you, have you regretted? Uh, being a writer? No, no, I'm, I'm very happy to, to be able to write and I feel very lucky that I'm from a country where there's so much to write about. Now, speaking about, you know, so much to write about, you know, would you able to give probably three pieces of uh, advice or pointers you know, to aspiring writers mm. who wish to write the way you write, <laughs> you know, um, what was, what was your your thought life and your code that you live by? Mm. I, uh, I think to be a writer, one thing that you really need is, um, or that I've benefited from, is routine. So I tend to write uh, from the morning until about two or three every day. And when, when I can follow that routine, then I find that creativity really flourishes. So for me, that's, that's one thing that's very important. Um, another thing that I think is very important is to spend a lot of time thinking about what you're writing before you write and after you write. So um, let's say if, you know, the novel that I'm write, working on right now, I was working on other books while I was thinking about it. So for almost two years I just thought about that novel and didn't really write anything. And then when I finally made the outline and you know figured out what the story was, I had already put a lot of thinking into it. So every day, you know, I write, and then the times when I'm not writing, um, I spend thinking about the novel and thinking about what's going to happen next, what should I do next, what happens to this character. So I think that is very important: is is to spend a lot of time thinking. Um, and then uh, I would say. One lesson that I learned very late as a writer, I've been writing for a while now, um, and one lesson I learned late is it's very important to um, really take care of yourself physically 
in terms of your health and also mentally. So whether it's through meditation or whether it's through other forms of just keeping your mind very clean and healthy and keeping your uh, body very healthy. Those things are very important um, because writing is a very um, concentrated mental activity and it's also physically you're sitting a lot. And so it's very important to balance that out by being healthy and, and moving and, and keeping yourself um, in, in balance. Is there one character that you wish to meet in, in all your writings so far <laughs> that, that you probably uh, love most and you don't mind having uh, you know, uh, going on a holiday with or even or even pursuit for a political cause. I'm sorry, you know. Uh, is there any any one character that that you have also so far? I think um, in my last novel, which is called Seasons of Flight, um, I have a protagonist who is <laughs> she's a young woman who is very enigmatic to herself. Also, she doesn't really understand. She, you know, she's not emotionally intelligent, so she doesn't understand what she's going through. And she's enigmatic to herself. She's a mystery to other people. People don't know what she's thinking, and she also doesn't know what she's thinking. Um, I think if I had, if I could meet any of my characters, she's someone I would like to meet, because I find that quite a, a compelling. I found that her very interesting to write about, instead of someone who would, you know really understands themselves and understands and is able to express themselves well and articulate what they're feeling or thinking, I think it would be interesting to see someone who can't do that. So um, I think she would probably be someone I'd love to spend some time with. What would be your one wish for Nepal? Oh, uh, for Nepal, if I could only have one wish. Um, or oh, three wishes, I make okay, it easier. Three, three, <laughs> three, be, three wishes. Three is great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say my first wish would be that we get a democratic constitution soon. It's, it's holding everything up, you know, the entire process of nation building is being held back by not having a good constitution in place. That would be one. The second one would be, I would say, um, the culture also has to become equal. Um, so there's a lot of inequality in Nepal, um, not necessarily in the law, but in terms of how social relations take place. Men and women are not considered or treated equal um, between the castes. There's a lot of... Um, on inequality in cultural life. And that, I think, is almost as important as the political uh, democratic framework is to have a, a democratic and equal kind of society. So that would be the second uh, wish. My third wish would be um, specifically for Kathmandu, because Kathmandu has grown a lot um, in the last 30 or 40 years. A lot of people from the countryside have moved there, and it's been a very unplanned move. So the city has grown hugely. It's almost three million people now and it's very disorganized. There's you know, very little drinking water, very little electricity and all of that. So I would want Kathmandu to get proper planning. That would be wonderful. Amazing. Now in all your writings, uh, have you ever encountered any uh, trademarks or copyright issues with other uh, authors you know, who may have read your book and said that to you, oh, is that the same title I wrote before, or <laughs> da da da, and the characters? Have you fa have you had a problem before? I haven't. No, no, I haven't. You're it's so fortunate. I've been very lucky. <laughs> yes. Once again, uh, all of you at the National Queen's Choice said hi at and hi at hotels and fans around the world. Please do not forget uh, to catch hold of her book, um, The Tilt Earth and a Boy from Skillis, uh, the life and times of Chandra Guru, who is the environmentalist himself. Uh, it's a great book, I must say. And also, uh, her other books like uh, Forget Kambandu and The Lives We Have Lost. Uh, and also, um, Ms. Uh, Madrushi, do you have a Facebook or probably a, a website that they could contact you? I do have. Um, my website is um, www.manjushritapa.com so my full name yes uh, dot com and um, I can be contacted through the website I have an email address listed there um, I'm on Twitter and on Facebook um, if you just look up my name I'll be there that's right and her spelling is M A N J U S H R E E uh, and her last name is T H A P A and you can Google her by the way and once again I'm Robin Steinberg here at the National Quiz Choice 
Have a great week ahead. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. I'm so sorry to take your time.